from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, today's lecture. I want to thank everyone for coming out. Um, my name is Jonathan Lohr, and I'm the South Asian Reference Librarian here in the Asian Division of the Library of Congress. And uh, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming out for what we have is a fantastic lecture today, The Sikh Legacy in Pakistan by author Amar Deep Singh. Uh, today's talk is presented by the Asian Division of the Library of Congress and the National Sikh Campaign. At the outset, I'd like to first extend my thanks to Dr. Rajwant Singh of the National Sikh Campaign uh, for putting me in touch with Amar Deep and uh, for also helping to promote today's event. Uh, please be advised that today's program will be recorded and later released as a webcast. So please turn off or silence your mobile phones and other devices. Also, please be advised that any questions uh, you may ask at the end of the program will be recorded and that the act of asking the question constitutes uh, permission for us to record and broadcast later as a webcast. Um, as a reminder, uh, there will be time for questions after uh, the talk, and we ask uh, that you uh, ask you know, short questions about topics relevant to the presentation as opposed to extended comments. Um, before we get started, I'd like to invite Dr. Chi Chu, the Asian Division's Head of Scholarly Services, uh, just to say a few words about the Asian Division and the Asian Reading Room at the Library of Congress. Dr. Chu. Thank you, Jonathan. On behalf of the Asian Division, welcome to this afternoon's event. So if you are familiar with the Library of Congress or its Asian collections, you probably will know that here at the library, the Asian division operates the Asian Reading Room, where general users can access both physical and digital collections in Asian languages and get research assistance from our subject specialists. The Asian division was formally founded in 1928 as the Division of Chinese Literature so this year actually marks the 90th anniversary of the Asian Division. Even though it was named the Division of Chinese Literature when it was founded, it started collecting Chinese and Japanese materials and received Mongolian and Tibetan materials as gifts in the late 19th century. So from the earliest gift presentation to the United States by the Emperor of China, the collections of Asian Division have grown to uh, represent one of the most comprehensive collections of Asian languages in the world. That is uh, uh, more than four million physical items. So these items are in more than 130 languages and include most subjects field, covering an area ranging from the South Asian subcontinent to Southeast Asia to East Asia. So in the next few mi minutes, Dr. Lohr will give a more detailed introduction of our South Asian collections. So users can access our collections at the Asian Reading Room, which is located in the Tho Thomas Jefferson Building across the Independence Avenue, on the first floor, room 150. So our Reading Room opens Monday to Friday from 8.30 to 5 p.m. So anyone who is 16 years older can come to use the library reading rooms. All you need to do is to bring a photo ID and get a reader registration card. Where the registration card location is also on the first floor of the Jefferson Building. And of course, it's always a good idea to consult library catalog and Asian uh, reading room website before you come to the library so that you can identify the materials that you will be looking at and make better use of your time at the library. So in addition to general books, we also have special collections and rare books in many Asian languages, and users need to make appointments with our librarians to use the rare items. And you can request appointments, request materials, and send research questions on the Asian Reading Room website at the link marked Ask a Librarian. So ask a librarian is an important phrase for you to remember. 
And also, we subscribe to many electronic resources in Asian studies, and users can access them anywhere in the library's campus. campus. All this information will be included in the brochure available here. And we hope that it will not be your last trip to the Library of Congress. And we hope to see you again in our reading room at the library. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chu. And in similar fashion, I'd like to give you the briefest of brief overviews of the South Asian collection that we have here at the Library of Congress. Uh, the South Asian collection, of course, contains materials from Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, the Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. The collection currently has about 332,000 monographic volumes, more than 1,000 active journals, and over 68,000 titles on microfiche. We have substantial holdings in many languages, including Hindi, Urdu, Bengali, Tamil, Gujarati, Punjabi, Telugu, Sindhi, Nepali, Rajasthani, and many more. For example, we have about 13,000 books in Punjabi alone. Much of this acquisition comes from our two overseas offices, one in New Delhi, established in 1962, and the other in Islamabad, established in 1965. Overall, the South Asian collection provides broad research coverage in most fields and disciplines, especially vernacular languages and literature, religion, philosophy, politics, history, and sociology. The collection is also very strong with regard to newspapers, journals, and government publications from South Asia. All of these materials, and you'll see some examples here in the slide behind me, all of these materials are just like today's lecture, free and open to the public. To request materials from our collections, all you need is your reader registration card, but in the meantime, you can browse our collections with the online catalog at catalog.loc.gov, and you can even limit your search by language. So you can pull up books on Sikhism and Sikh history in Punjabi, Urdu, English, whichever language you like. We also hope everyone can visit the Asian Reading Room in the Jefferson Building, Room 150, where you can access all of our materials in these South Asian languages. You can learn more about the South Asian collection on the website of the Asian Reading Room, and we also invite you to check out the Library of Congress Four Corners of the World blog and International Collections Facebook page, both of which contain information on special items in our collections, as well as info on upcoming events and lectures like today's lecture. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Rajwant Singh to say a few words and to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Singh is co-founder of the National Sikh Campaign, president of EcoSeek, and secretary of the Guru Gobind Singh Foundation in Rockville, Maryland, to name only a few of the organizations in which he serves. Please welcome Dr. Rajwant Singh. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, for this uh, a warm welcome, and uh, we are extremely thrilled and excited to be uh, to be here, and uh, uh, are trying to take the advantage of uh, Amadeep's uh, being here and enlightening us uh, about this wonderful and uh, very valuable treasure that uh, our community has, but yet still not discovered. So um, we are very much thankful to the. Um, Library of Congress here, and uh, the Asia Division. And I had no knowledge that uh, you have four million books on Asian languages and 130 um, different languages um, from the Asian uh, region. And uh, this is something which we would want our kids and children of our community to be exposed to, and uh, hopefully we'll develop some working relationship with the Asia Division here. And we are also very delighted to hear that there's a uh, 30,000 Punjabi books, which is an amazing collection that uh, we should be taking advantage of. And so as we are moving towards the 550th anniversary of the birth of Guru Nanak next year, hopefully we'll be planning um, some events with the Asia Division, uh, hopefully, in the next year. And uh, so I want to thank once again Jonathan for working hard and really putting this thing together. And um, hopefully uh, we will um, continue this relationship 
And I uh, want to thank the Chief of the Asia Division, Dr. Shao, uh, for being here and uh, you know, opening the doors of the library for our community and for this lecture. And Amardeep um, has uh, really done um, an amazing job of um, exposing all of us to something that we, we had no idea. And uh, in his lecture, he will definitely uh, give us a glimpse of uh, the, the, the immense um, treasure that the community has left in Pakistan uh, over 70 years ago. And um, as our community has only been focused on the religious pilgrimage and uh, really focused on um, restoring some of the most important uh, religious shrines, but for Amardeep to really open up, open our eyes to the, the legacy of the Sikh Empire, Maharaja Ranjit Singh, and all the warriors, and the wonderful relationships that these warriors and these kings and administrators had built with the local population in uh, Pakistan and the Northwest Front. Uh, so that, that is, uh, uh, really has excited the community throughout the world, and especially the Washington area. We have had uh, two opportunities for him to speak at different gurdwaras. And uh, there are a lot of young people who are uh, in becoming interested in, in knowing more about this. And our hope is that uh, from this um, phase, we go to the next phase of really preserving these, uh, these monuments and uh, uh, these uh, work of art and work of history that we, we can keep this alive for coming generations. So Amardeep has, uh, was born in Gorakhpur, India, and uh, has lived in India, Hong, Hong Kong, and Singapore, and has been educated at the Dune School. And uh, he pursued his electronics engineering at uh, Manipal Institute of Technology and Masters in uh, Business Administration at the University of Chicago. And uh, while he was working for American Express, um, suddenly he uh, developed this passion, which he has, you know, he had the passion in photography, but now from the last three and a half years, he has dedicated his life to really uh, working on the, the Sikh uh, legacy in Pakistan. And he's written these two wonderful books. And those of you who have not yet um, uh, gotten them, we will be able to acquire them for you. Uh, please uh, give your name or uh, contact information to myself. We can get them available to you. So we really want to, on behalf of the community, we want to thank Amardeep for your dedication and your hard work. And we are also uh, very delighted that his wonderful wife is with us. Would you please stand up and be, be recognized? Please welcome her. Amardeep, Amardeep would not have accomplished what he has done in the last three, three or four years without the support of his wonderful wife. So Amardeep, once again, thank you so much. And on behalf of the community, we welcome you. Please, uh, we are here to listen to you. Thank you. Um, thank you uh, to the uh, Asian Division of the Library of Congress and uh, to the National Sikh Campaign for having created this platform uh, to allow me to share some of the insights from my two books. Uh, the one which is which is uh, you're seeing on the on the screen, which is the first book on your right hand side of the screen, which is called "The Lost Heritage of the Sikh Legacy in Pakistan," and the second book, which is called. The quest continues, Lost Heritage, the Sikh Legacy in Pakistan. Um, both these books are a culmination in the short way, I can say, uh, uh, of a journey that I started in 2014 when I stepped into Pakistan for the first time. Um, and it's taken me about three and a half years to document the remnants, both tangible and intangible, across Pakistan 
in uh, 126 cities and villages. But actually, in true sense, I don't think this would have been possible uh, in such a short span of time had I not unknowingly been preparing myself for the day the divine would choose me to step into the country and uh, himself start showing me the places through a strange energy that was engulfing me and connecting me to people uh, which allowed me to kind of experience what I have experienced and written and chosen to write in these two books because I think these books are going to be a valuable work for posterity because in seven decades um, we've not had uh, another publication as I see and that's the reason why I decided when I went to Pakistan that I need to dedicate my few years of, of my life into documenting this what I'd seen because there are people who have deep pockets, they can serve through wealth, there are people who can serve through time, and I choose to serve through my time and my, my own research that I've done. Uh, so in many ways, there's a lot of opportunity that you give up when you take up such works. Uh, it's a career that I've sacrificed, uh, but I'm glad I've done it because it's a path that has not been treaded on by anyone for seven decades. And uh, the, a lot of people ask me um, how challenging this work has been and I want to start with that itself, that you know, challenges are abound. Multitudes of challenges have come on my way, but the, but the, the essence is that, that works like these, if they were easy, then theoretically you should be having uh, many, many more publications like these available in the market. So if you take a monument like Taj Mahal, I mean, there are more than 10,000 books available. So why is it that for the Sikh legacy in Pakistan, there are no more books available? And therein lies the answer to the question as to how challenging it is. It is not a bed of roses, but yet some strange energy has created the path for me. And for this, I want to thank the people of Pakistan because they embraced me. Uh, I was a, simply a man with a passionate uh, desire to understand something about our past, our roots. But if they wouldn't have embraced me, unknown people, the work would not have happened. I also want to thank Pakistan government uh, we were hoping someone from the embassy would have been here today, uh, but unfortunately they're not here. But I, I take it a point to actually thank them because it's my forefathers who left their heritage in the lands where they had churned it for years and centuries, and they've left it in their custody. Uh, I think Pakistan government, from the unfortunate circumstances that developed in 1947, where the two nations got divided based on religious uh, tug of war, a uh, civil, civil war that happened, um, and communities got uprooted from both the sides. 10 million people moved in 1947, 1 million people died. Um, but yet, in seven decades, I think the government has started embracing these various footprints that are there. The, the heritage is too large to be embraced in, in, in totality. Much of it is lost. But even an effort that, that embraces a small magnitude of it I think it's a step in the right direction. It's a change which can take a different form through publications like these as we create awareness around the world. Hopefully a bigger change can happen. But I want to thank Pakistan government for whatever they have embraced. It's small, but it's a good start. Uh, I want to thank them also for having embraced me and my pursuit for the uh, creation of the second book because the areas that have gone in the second publication, the quest continues, lost heritage of Sikh legacy in Pakistan, actually are very, very remote areas and some of the forts and the areas in the Pakistan army controlled areas would not have been actually ever possible to experience had they not embraced me and opened the gates. So for that, I want to thank them also. Now, before I start, uh, I just want to actually put down a few, uh, I want to show you a small, small uh, video here, sorry. A small video here of me on the on the field and then I'll get down to the to the
So why I'm showing this, uh, this video is uh, researching uh, across the country where there is really no chartered path and you don't know where these monuments are lying. For seven decades, they've been abandoned. We have history telling us some of the forts and some of the bigger structures, but really to go inside the interiors, for instance, this is an unidentified monument. I have documented it in my book because the beautiful frescoes inside it and it's, it's, uh, its state where it is standing today uh, about to fall apart conveys a lot of emotion and the frescoes convey a lot of uh, valuable message as to how our forefathers were living. I thought it is important to document, but these are the unknown, unrecognized monuments wiped out from the history. I don't even know who made it, why they was, it was made. Is there a history associated with it? I have no idea. And that man who was walking with me right in the beginning, uh, he basically is that unknown, I mean, the unknown Pakistani who became a very good friend of mine like that. There have been about 40, 50 people who have embraced me and walked in the fields, in the forests, in the, in the high hills and in the plains of Pakistan to make my work happen. So that's what I want to actually convey out of that. Works like this can be seen from any community's lens. Because when a turmoil happens, turmoil does not impact one community alone. And therefore, we need to start by the recognition that um, not just the Sikhs, but all communities suffered in the violence that erupted, the civil, uh, civil war that emitted, uh, erupted across the Indian subcontinent in 1947. If I was to turn this lens and choose to do this work out of uh, Muslim legacy, the story is the same. If I was to do it from a Hindu or a Jain legacy, the story is the same. And therefore, I say in this slide is Hindu, Muslim, Sikhs, Christians, Parsis, Jains, Buddhists, and I would say even the atheists suffered. Because I don't know what is the belief system of a man who, who projects himself to be a believer of a certain faith. You don't know inside his heart whether he really believes in the existence of God or no. And yet, the nation was divided on belief systems of God in the form of religion. And which resulted in the, in the hypothesis that, uh, it's a big hypothesis that under the two-nation theory, Two communities cannot live together. The Hindus and the Muslims cannot live together as British were, were leaving the subcontinent. The assumption was the two communities cannot exist together. Uh, from, a, from a Sikh perspective, I have started believing that the Sikh community was a mere cucumber in the sandwich. Uh, the third community, which was not even thought of, and his, which, which in this, in this two two-nation two theory which emerged, it was not even put into the mix till the last moment. In the last few one or two years, it came into the mix. And, and its history had churned primarily in the lands that became Pakistan. And this painful saga of all communities, which were divided in 1947 as British left the Indian subcontinent, is described well in the two-line poetry of, uh, of Shah Daman, who says, Basically, what it means is that the red eyes, the bloodshot red eyes, say it all that both you and we wept. So we need to start from this baseline of understanding as I get into specific subject of the Sikh legacy in Pakistan. Now, what I want to put as a, as a context here, as Dr. Rajwan just said, that the Sikh community's attention has primarily been focused on just religious aspects across Pakistan, not just the Sikh community. The entire world believes that the Sikh community's entire existence across Pakistan seven decades after partition is basically the few Gurdwaras, the Sikh temples of worship, like Nankana Sahib, where Guru Nanak, the founder of Sikh faith, was born, or where some stories attached with his life, like Panja Sahib, or the fifth guru's place like um, your um, uh, the Dera Sahib and a few more Gurdwaras. The entire community's thinking is, is kind of restricted on this domain. Not just the Sikh, the Muslims inside Pakistan also believe that this is their heritage which we are maintaining very properly. Now, I must tell you my experience when I did this book uh, and the first book, my, my feeling in giving the title was, yes, I could have just called it the Sikh legacy in Pakistan, but sometimes you need to shake the system with a positive intent. Our intent is not here to kind of, kind of finger point and, and me versus you. It's, that's not the intent. The intent is to document, let's, move, let's accept what's happened, let's move forward positively. But yet, sometimes you have to give a statement, and therefore I chose the name of this book. The title is 
the Sikh legacy in Pakistan, but I chose the name of the book as Lost Heritage. And when I use the word Lost Heritage, I have taken a long time to kind of build the equity with the government in Pakistan that I don't mean wrong. But yet, the first reaction, what I'm telling you, is that even in Pakistan, they believe that the heritage of Sikhs is basically Nankana Sahib, Panja Sahib, Dera Sahib, these three, four, five, six Gurdwaras, and we are maintaining it fine. By writing Lost Heritage, the first reaction that I, I remember I got from the Pakistan government itself was, why are you calling it Lost Heritage? We have maintained it. And that's where you then realize that, boy, how big a problem it is. Because when communities get locked out from the lands where their generations had churned the history, the history just evaporates. Not from the minds of the communities itself, who churned that history in that land, but also the ones who own the responsibility to hold that history in that land. It just evaporates over a period of time. My forefathers were not so incompetent that they only made four or five Gurdwaras that the world knows Pakistan today as. My forefathers were not so incompetent that we as the community, as the descendants of that, that generation should be only driven to go to these three or four Gurdwaras. There is so much more in the offer we have simply forgotten. And therefore I want to bring your attention to this slide where on the bl black outline you see the Indian subcontinent which was the British India as we know, in 1947 when they were leaving. Having come to Calcutta, they actually started moving. Um, sorry, I'll, allow me a minute. I just want to take my pointer out here. Uh, so having come into Calcutta in, uh, in 1700s, as the British started expanding, with the help of Bengal army, the Purbia soldiers, the later on the Madras regiments, they started expanding. They came to the Satlaj River and they came to a halt out here. Because the last standing kingdom, the independent kingdom at that time was this yellow kingdom, which was being ruled by Ranjit Singh, and its, its capital was Lahore. Now, the historical texts, especially the British texts, have written this as the Sikh kingdom. The Sikh records themselves, like the Umdat Uth Tariq, the five Persian volumes, five volume Persian works of day to day accounts of what was happening in Ranjit Singh's kingdom in Lahore. It was a very detailed account, which has recently been translated into English by the Guru Nanak Dev University in, in Amritsar. If you read that, actually, there's no mention of Sikh kingdom or the Sikh Raj, there's nothing like that. It simply refers to it as Khalsa Sarkar. The Khalsa is a, basically a Puritan concept. It's a concept which says, the, the world in a purity and form which actually allows to embrace all communities. It's a very secular concept, uh, purity, right? And that's what this kingdom was termed as. British call it as a Sikh kingdom because they saw Ranjit Singh, the man who was ruling, ruling out of Lahore, to be a man who was a believer of the Sikh faith, and therefore they call it. I question that because, yes, it was truly a Khalsa Sarkar in terms of its purity and uh, mindsets because they were implementing that. They had an army which comprised of Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims, Punjabis. For the first time in 3,000 years after Porus, attack, Alexander attacked uh, Punjab, it's the first time after 3,000 years that the Punjabis themselves rose and a man of the soil formed a kingdom. And yes, prior to that, the history goes that the Bhangi missile had formed a kingdom out, uh, out of Lahore, uh, had, had taken over Lahore. But a truly a big empire like that, for the first time in the history of Punjab, a man of the soil, Ranjit Singh formed it. And he pulled together people of all faith. Muslims, Hindu, Sikhs rallied around him. In spite of differences of faith, they came together for one cause, and that was what we call as Punjabiyat. And today that Punjabiyat seems to be fragmented thanks to 1947. His foreign minister signed the treaty with the British that decided that this was the line on the east side of the empire of the Sikh, of the Sikh kingdom, which the British call, uh, which the British will not cross. He signed the treaty with Afghanistan, which today is known as the Duran Line. You know what? If history has to be rewritten, the man who really uh, signed this treaty and who should be given the credit, it was Fakir Azaizuddin, Ranjit Singh's foreign minister, or Ranjit Singh himself, because this line was drawn by them running right through the Pashtun territory. But the British actually having recognized 
felt the need of recognizing the man who led the expedition, the first Anglo-Afghan war, which happened in, in Kabul, going through Kandahar via Sindh, was led by the man called Duran. So they called this as the Duran line in recognition. But really this line was created by Fakir Azizuddin, the foreign minister of, of, uh, of Ranjit Singh. All I want to say is that this man's empire stretched from Ladakh, Kashmir, Baltistan, Khyber area, the two nations today are fighting over Kashmir, India and Pakistan. Millions of people, have, thousands of lives have, have been lost uh, since 1947 in this tug of war. But people have, are not even aware today that the man who brought Ladakh, Baltistan and Kashmir onto the map of India and Pakistan is Ranjit Singh. Because if not for him, Kashmir today would be a part of Afghanistan, because Duranis were ruling it for 110 years before he brought it into the Lahore Darbar and then British took it over the Punjab and therefore it became a part of British India. All I want to say is that if you take this mighty empire, which was the last standing empire of what became British India, and you lay it over the, in, the, the Pakistan and India, what you find is the line of, the Ratcliffe line runs till here and after that becomes the line of control dividing Kashmir. 80% of that territory is today in Pakistan. And that's the one statement I want to make out of this, this slide. 80% of that territory today is in Pakistan and 20% is in India. And therefore the question that I'm asking again, were my forefathers so incompetent that they only made these two or three Gurdwaras, right? And therefore as I stood uh, at this grave while going up to uh, Mansera, uh, sorry, this grave is at Mansera while going to, to Kashmir, uh, Muzaffarabad, at this graveyard, in this, on this grave, behind these, these uh, shrubs and the plants out here, you see behind there's a, there's a plaque out here on which is written in Urdu, Gulam Sarwar Wald Makhan Singh. Gulam Sarwar, a Muslim who lies buried here, whose father, a Sikh, Makhan Singh, whose father was Makhan Singh, a Sikh. Now, I don't need to know or I don't have any idea as to what happened to Gulam Sarwar. Why he, did he convert his faith and why is he lying buried here? But the point I'm trying to make out of this, this grave is that legacy is not religion. Because this grave is also a part of my legacy. A Sikh's son is lying buried here and therefore I see this as a part of my legacy and the story needs to be documented. And that thought when I saw this grave is what actually motivated me to embark on this journey to document in the form of a publication because I did not go to Pakistan to write a book. I consider myself as an accidental author. I have been in the corporate world for about 25 years. I was the regional head for Asia Pacific for, for American Express uh, for the revenue management. In 2014, for certain reasons, I left my job because I had been there for 25 years. I was looking for something else. But in the six months of the cooling down period that I was actually going through, I just thought that I need to go up to Kashmir to my father's place because in 1947, when he was ousted because of the Kashmir problem, which started after the partition of 1947 of Punjab, I don't call it as a partition of India, I call it as a partition of Punjab and partition of Bengal, because that's what it was. The problem of Kashmir starts much later. The problem of Kashmir starts in October 1947, on 21st October 1947, when Kashmir is attacked by the tribals. And what our forefathers, my, my father, my aunt, my uncles used to tell us is that they never could go back to this part of Kashmir, which is in Pakistan, because they then were shifted and ousted and, 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 and rebuilt their lives in, in Gorakhpur, in UP. Uh, but he used to tell that uh, on, the, on the morning of 21st October 1947, our aunt and uncles got up uh, to a huge war cry, which was Hindu ka zar or Sikh ka sar. Zar is a Persian word. Uh, loot the Hindus and behead the Sikhs. And on this bridge, about 300 people were rounded up, 300 Sikhs were rounded up. And this is the first attack of Kashmir which happens at Muzaffarabad. It's the western frontier. And they were shot on both the sides. There's a, uh, and, and many bodies fell. My, my uh, uh, mother-in-law's parents both died on this bridge in this, in this uh, unfortunate incident. There's a chapter in this first book called Meeting Nuri. Nuri was Jaswanti, a Sikh girl. Uh, who now lives in Rawalpindi. She is my distant aunt. Uh, and she lost both her parents. She was just four and a half years old on this, on this same bridge. And she 
has the impression so strong in her mind that even at the age of 75 years, she can recount everything that happened that day. Now, a four and a half year old child recounting, that's amazing. Because I can't recount what I actually remember, what I may have experienced at the age of 10 or 12. But here's a child, here's an old woman who at the age of four and a half years, what she experienced is recounting it. And I wanted to go to this bridge, basically to pick up the soil. I wanted to... F I I wanted to pass it down to our next generation, our two daughters, just to remind them that wherever you go in this global village that we are living in today, don't forget your roots. And therefore, I decided in that six-month period that I was cooling down after my American Express career uh, that I must go to Pakistan. All my vision was that I want to go into Pakistan. I didn't go to write a book. I just decided to head towards Muzaffarabad I decided, like every other Sikh, that I must go and visit Nankana Sahib, Panja Sahib. But I also knew from the history books that a huge, glorious chapter of my tradition actually happened in these lands. So I wanted to go and experience, are there some remnants there? I had no idea whether I will find anything. And as I therefore embarked on this journey, on the 15th day of my journey, I got a 30-day visa to enter the first time. On the 15th day, I did reach Muzaffarabad, and as I picked up the soil, something within me said, don't do this. Because by passing to the next generation the soil, you might be passing down a memory which I don't want to pass down of hatred between communities. And therefore, I left it, and I think that I did the right thing, because what I've done is, more than the soil, is to capture the experiences in these two books that's more valuable than the soil. But when I saw the turning of the Jhelum River at the Muzaffarabad, this is the town where my, fa my father was born, that U-turn symbolized that, yes, the communities did make a U-turn in 1947. Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs chose to look away from each other. And therefore, when I came back, I had been to 36 cities and villages in 30 days, and I thought it was important to write this journey in the form of a picture travelogue, expressing all that I had experienced and telling a little bit of history so that Posterity can remember that seven decades after partition, someone went and at that point of time, he saw where the heritage was standing. 70% of our heritage is finished, is my estimate. It's my gut estimate. There's nothing to, there's no data out here to validate that. It's my gut estimate that 70% is finished. But yet I felt that it was important to document it, that we should have some remnants to remind our future generations that this is what it was seven decades after partition. But you know what? Sometimes journeys that seem to have ended actually are boiling to take another shape. And that's exactly what was happening to me because when I published this book, I was called at many forums around the world to talk about it. And as I kept on talking, I realized that having published the book, I'd gone on a journey around the world, speaking at about some 75 seminars around the world in about eight months. At that point, I felt the, the book needs to be left. I need to go back to my corporate world and I need to start, start looking at my daily chores of earning a living. But you know what, as I took up a job, deep inside me, something was disturbing me. And what was disturbing me was that I, in my journey of the first book, had stood at Jamrod, right at the Khyber Pass, where Hari Singh Nalwa had made the fort of Jamrod. And thereafter, no invasion has ha happened from the, from the Khyber Pass for good 200-odd uh, years. Now, is it because of Jamrod, or is it just a matter of destiny? I don't know. But yet, when the fort was made after that, the thousand years of invasions from the Central Asian lands into the Indian subcontinent did stop. I could not go inside there because Hari Singh Nalwa died there and yet I wanted to experience that place where his body was kept and what was there inside that fort, I could not experience it. Atak, as I stood at the Atak River, I was reminded of that journey that Alexander Burns did because as the Treaty of Amritsar was signed between British and the and the uh, and the um, Ranjit Singh in 1809, saying both of sides will respect each other. British had already started sending spies into Pakistan, into into in, into Punjab, and the mission was basically to find out what is the power of this kingdom. Can we do something? Can we tomorrow take it over? And as those missions went, many of the spy missions submitted their reports, of course, all of them submitted reports to Calcutta, to the East India Company, but some wrote their personal travelogues. And I had read these travelogues. One of them was William Moorcroft in 1809, 1819 he went uh, into, into uh, Lahore. Uh, and then he went right up to Kashmir, to Ladakh, from Lahore. 
But the most interesting one was where I'm talking about Atak because Alexander Burns had never stepped into India. Later on in the first Afghan war, he was hacked to death in Kabul. But he had never come to India. And he was given this mission that we want to find out can ships be taken inside Punjab. How do you take ships inside Punjab and Punjab does not even touch the sea? So he was put onto a ship and said, here are five high pedigree horses. Take them through the Arabian Sea, take it into the Indus River and sail it upwards and see how deep can you take the, the, horse, uh, the ship inside the, Arab uh, in the Indus River and see where it goes and docks. And he sailed with five high pedigree horses to gift it to Ranjit Singh in Lahore. That was just a, gifting was just a, a, an excuse to, to lead the secret mission. And he docked the ship at the Atak Fort on the Indus River. And I was standing there and that, that sight looked familiar because when I was a young kid, I read the journey of Alexander Burns. That picture had stayed imprinted in my mind. And when I was standing in my first journey, wanting to go inside the Atak Fort, I could not go inside because both Jamrod and Atak are under the control of Pakistan Army. Now, layers of generations have, and dynasties have actually played a role in Atak. Like, for instance, the Mughals, Sher Shah Suri, prior to that, um, Ranjit Singh, under the Sikh rule uh, in, in Lahore, um, then the, the British, now the Pakistanis are actually playing a role. But I wanted to go inside because I could see that picture. Alexander Burns came and docked his his, uh, his ship here to prove that ships and a navy could be brought into, pa into Punjab. And if British wanted to attack Punjab from both the sides, they could compress it by bringing in the navy and from this side bringing in the army from the Indian subcontinent. Nothing happened actually on that front. But Alexander Burns wrote his travelogue, how he took the horses to Lahore and gifted it to Ranjit Singh. Beautiful travelogues. And I, in my mind, after the first book, in the nights I would I would see the, 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 the dreams of Atak and Jamrod as though mission had been incomplete. And as I looked at this picture of DJF Newall, which after the second Anglo-Sikh war in 1849, 1851, DJF Newall travels to the Tanawal range uh, along the river Indus and stands at Darban and looks down and marks where all the Sikh forts were. And this publication was published later on, about 20 years later. And I'm wondering, in 1947, the Sikh community was pretty much resident in these lands till 1947, after which they were ousted. And why is it that I can't find any book since the journey of 1851 of DJF Newall till the time of 1947 when cameras had existed? Why hasn't anyone from my community gone and simply taken a panoramic image of that same land and marked where the forts had once existed? These were mud forts, small forts. So the community today only associates Hari Singh Nalwa with Jamrod and does not know anything more about Hari Singh Nalva or his role that he played in 27 forts along the river Indus. There's a documented evidence of that in the, in the history. So we don't know. And I'm thinking this is valuable to be documented again, but I'm struggling through as to how does one go back to Pakistan? I had experienced it and I was wondering how does one go back and how do one, does one do document this? But then when you start believing in something, Strangely enough, the, the energies do come together. And, and I'm, I'm blessed because Pakistan government uh, themselves invited me for a seminar, uh, for, a, for a conference in Islamabad. And what I had done with my first book was wherever I went around the world, I'm accepting the fact that partition has happened. I cannot change it. Pakistan cannot change it. We cannot change it. What can we learn from this? What can we talk in terms of human values? And what can we actually bring about as a positive change is what I was trying to spread as a message. And I think the Pakistan establishment did appreciate that, that the person was not trying to make it a political pitch out of it. Because there's enough of politics and, 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 and uh, much linking that's been happening for years and years. What do we do going forward? Um, and I was invited to Islamabad to take part in a conference uh, where, where my first publication was I, I was not being invited to talk there, but I think they recognized that from Singapore, someone's done some, some work on Pakistan's heritage, and so they invited me. In my mind, I thought that this is the right opportunity to ask the Pakistan government that if you think I've done something all right, then please open the gates of Jamrod and Atak and show it to me. That is all I had asked for, and I've, if possible, please take me to the Darband area to see that forts where they had existed. Are there still some remains lying there. That's all I had visioned for and asked. And as I landed in Pakistan, a beautiful energy 
by the government and as well as the people started engulfing me once again. And I say this, the work is thanks to the people of Pakistan who have actually enabled this for me. Because as they embraced me, the energy started engulfing me to a point I asked myself, do I go back or do I continue with this? And I think I made the right choice because I could have easily gone back. There was a job waiting for me. I would have actually just been doing a nine to five. But I decided to just let the energy take me forward. And as it took me forward, I stayed there for another 50 days, of which 40 days I spent in research, traveling across Pakistan from Baltistan to Khyber to Punjab to Sindh and Balochistan, uh, and having realized after about 40, to 40 days of journey and 50 days I was in Pakistan that I'd been to 90 cities and villages this time. And when I came back, it was too humongous a data that I had actually got of our heritage, our composite heritage of all our communities together. Uh, I thought that this needs to be again documented because it has not been done. The, new ch the future generation needs to know what had churned in these lands. And therefore, I didn't go back into the corporate world and I started documenting it. I want to share a few stories before I move down to what the essence of the presentation is as to what has Amadeep learned out of his journeys across Pakistan. The, I want to talk about the remains of a Sikh Gurdwara a gurdwara, a, a place of Sikh worship, along near River Indus at a village called Kot Fateh Khan. Kot Fateh Khan, this is the gurdwara, these are the remains, the, the, the walls have actually all broken down, the gate is just standing there. Um, I go inside there and I'm appreciating the, the beautiful frescoes inside this, this samad out here. And what I see is that our forefathers had a very secular pluralistic mindset because on these frescoes it was Punjabiyat that they were reflecting. It was not faiths that they were reflecting. It was a composite culture, stories of the lands of Punjab, whether it be Heer Ranja, Soni Maiwal, uh, whether it be uh, Ranjit Singh himself or if there, it, at places even Allah is written. You know, I think what they're trying to to represent is what Punjab was representing as a cultural aspect. Faith and culture are two sides of a coin because we cannot segregate the two things. And yes, your faith and unorganized thinking and a religion takes a form over a period of time, but yet cultural aspects cannot be ignored because faiths emerge from the foundation of cultures that churn in a particular land and the stories that churn there. And I'm looking at these frescoes in a pretty sad state because for seven decades, the community is not there, they've not been maintained, they're nearly finishing off. And my first thought that comes to my mind is that the Sikh community is in a very sad state. And I coined a statement out here, which I say it all the time when I go around the world. The Sikh community lost it there, which is in Pakistan, in the creation of 1947, um, and moving out of the country. But the Sikh community destroyed it here, which is in East Punjab. Because frescoes and monuments like these, there are none existing in East Punjab now. If our heritage, although in a sad state, because we, have, we are not existing in these lands, and therefore no one can take care of it, if they are yet existing, they are existing in the last uh, forms in the lands of Pakistan. In, in East Punjab, we have destroyed it all ourselves because we have a fancy for modernizing our structures with marble and gold. Replacing frescoes, replacing artworks with a preference for white marble and materialistic gold, we are leaving nothing for our next generation to delve into to the beautiful, beauty, sto beautiful stories that these, these frescoes conveyed. There's nothing left. And someone in Delhi had asked me when I was presenting as to when will you do this work for the Sikh legacy in East Punjab? And my answer was I will never probably do it. Because my soul finds it, itself flying in the stratosphere when I go to Pakistan because these monuments take me into a different realm altogether. Only I know what I experience in these lands. In East Punjab, I cannot feel that. I feel dead monuments. I feel the whiteness and the materialistic uh, imprint of gold is leaving nothing for the next generation to really understand from where we emerged and what value system our forefathers were trying to tell us through the, through the art forms. 
But as I was standing here, invariably in my stories that you'll find in the book, one or the other old man, as we call as Babas, would definitely appear. And a Baba appeared out here. And I've called this Gurdwara as Sultan Than Singh, but the Gurdwara actually is called as Baba Than Singh. In the Punjabi terminology, especially in the Sikh terminology, the people whom we revere, the saints and the, and the, and the elevated people as Baba, the one who's the man with the wisdom. But in the Muslim, Islamic tradition, a man with a, with a power, be it spiritual power or a, or a materialistic power or a, or a power of, of, uh, of uh, military power is called as Sultan. So out here, the Baba Than Singh Gurdwara, the villagers now call it as Sultan Than Singh. And I was standing out here and the villager, this old man came in and he started talking to me. He said, Salaam to me. And I, and I said, Salaam to him also. And he told a few things. One thing he said was, every Friday, we still come to this Gurdwara and we light a lamp. Jumma is, is a Friday prayers. And after that, what he says, all the villagers come here and there's a mark of respect for seven decades We've been lighting a lamp out here. Now, whatever the politics may have done, whatever the divisions may have been, the man's or the villager's uh, sane voice of humanity is still wanting to associate with the fact that this was the largest monument of that village and a tradition must be kept alive and therefore they live, put a lamp out there. And as I'm looking at the, at the various uh, writings on the wall, at one place, at most of the places where things are, our forefathers used to only use two languages. The more westwards you go, you only find in the Sikh Gurdwaras only Urdu and Gurmukhi is written. There is to be no Hindi or the Devanagari script. And as I am looking at the Urdu and the, and the Gurmukhi, at the Urdu places, there has been some black paint which has been put through. And I can read through that, that wherever Baba Than Singh has been written, it has been blackened. But edges into that, wherever in Gurmukhi Baba Than Singh is written, it's not been blackened. So I asked the Baba himself, the man of wisdom who was there, why have they blackened the places where in Urdu Baba Than Singh is written? And his reply to me was beautiful. What he says is, you know, the villagers say that he was indeed Baba Than Singh for the Sikhs, but now he's our Sultan Than Singh. It's yet the emotion for that man, emotion for that place, which is being held on is the value that I want to actually people to take away from these things uh, that humans do care. Humans do care. Um, the ill-fated well, I, I unfortunately the narratives, you know, history is his story, whose story you want to listen to, it's always biased. And it always takes rising above to understand that sometimes history has to be understood. Most of the times history needs to be layered out of biases to be really understood. Unfortunately, when I presented the Sikh legacy in Pakistan in terms of my two books in, uh, in Delhi, one of the university professors actually got up and she made a very valid point because I was alluding to it. I said the Sikhs were basically a cucumber in the sandwich in the, in the two nation uh, concept of Hindu and Sikhs. Uh, Hindu and Muslims cannot stay together. And what basically happened was that our entire history Unfortunately, it doesn't find prominence in the, in the textbooks in Pakistan, but our history does not even find prominence in the, in the textbooks in, in India. It's just a passing mention of the Sikh gurus and it finishes off because I've studied history out there and I've seen the history books in, in Pakistan of the Punjab University. And looking at that, it pains me because the history which basically uh, churned on these lands has been forgotten because Probably in Pakistan, this was a non-Islamic era. And in India, it's a history that churned in the lands of Pakistan. So from both the sides, I see it's the unfortunate thing is that the Sikhs have lost the element of the history and therefore we own the responsibility of owning the history ourselves. No one's going to protect it for us. We have to protect it ourselves. And therefore, therefore when I looked at the partition violence, I must remind that partition violence, though Punjab got divided, which is unfortunate because Punjab could not have been divided in any, any form or any way. There were multiple formulas being, being explored, but yet what happened was on the blood of the common Punjabi, two nations were created. But Punjab was a composite culture where Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs had stayed together for centuries and lived, coexisted together. But it was divided. But what people have forgotten is that Punjab was the last state to experience violence in the violence of India that divided the nation. 
the nation's violence did not start from Punjab. It started from as far away in the east, in Calcutta, in 1946, August. And it spread into Nokhali in Bengal. It spread into UP Bihar, where Muslims got massacred. And as waves of Muslims moved towards Sindh, many passed through Punjab. Punjab was fine because Punjab was being ruled by a secular party of Khizr Tiwana who had uh, Muslims, Hindus and Sikhs collectively representing the Punjab government under the British regime. And Punjab did not face any problem till actually under pressure Khizr Tiwana resigns on 3rd of March 1947 resulting in uh, a questioning by the Sikh and the Hindu leadership and thereafter a wave of uh, of genocide emerges in the villages around Laval Pindi. And this particular village, Toha Khalsa, is documented to be the first village where the violence occurred. And this is the remains of the Dukh Panjani Gurdwara. And I wanted to go here to document this because what happened here was 75 women on the fifth or sixth day after being locked inside the Dukh Panjani Gurdwara came out and jumped inside this well. And I wanted to document this and I went inside Toha Khalsa and I was looking for the well and this Baba, again an old man of wisdom, strangely appears on the road and I stopped the vehicle and I looked down at him. I got down and I went to him and I said, Baba Salam. And he looks at me and he says, where have you come from? And he was surprised and he gave me a hug and I asked him, Baba tell me where is that well where 75 women, history tells us, jumped inside on, on 7th or 8th of March 1947. He took out his, his, his uh, spectacles, wiped his tears, and he says, you know what, I was 18 years old, and it happened in front of my eyes. What is the probability of walking on the streets and you stumble upon someone who has been a live witness to the, to the entire event? And as I actually followed him, he took me to the place, and I felt that this well needs to be documented because the tragedy of Punjab, which resulted in displacing of communities and creating a drift amongst us for, for forever, actually, I had to document it. And I've done that in this book because it's important for the next few generations. And I again thank Pakistan government that they enabled my trip inside the Jamrod Fort. And this time in the second book, I was standing on top of this bastion and looking on this side towards the Khyber Pass and the two mountains coming and meeting and that what a picture it is I've taken in my second book of showing the mountains coming down. For 1,000 years, the Central Asians had come from there into the subcontinent. And when this fort was made in 50 days, thereafter, the history has not had any invasion. Because of this fort or because of other reasons, there could be many other factors. But history does also point that after this fort, construction at the Khyber, there has been no further invasion. As I walked up to this side of the bastion, the room where Hari Singh, bought, Hari Singh Nalwa's body was kept after he died battling the Afghan invasion into Punjab, for three days he was kept in this room. On the other side, yet in Urdu is written the incident where, which, which led to his death. And when I was going up, I looked at this room falling apart. I requested the commander in the, in the, in the fort that please don't let this room go away. We don't know what happens with the history going forward or, sorry, not with the history, with the boundaries or with the passport regimes or visa regimes. We don't know what the future has in store for us. But if this room falls apart, the sentiments associated with the Sikhs for this one room are so large, but tomorrow the tourism potential for Pakistan is so strong inside this that this can become the next wave to bring in the Sikhs to show them their heritage in Pakistan. So don't let this go. I was promised by the commander that they will look into actually getting this, uh, this room restored, but I hope they do. Uh, as I looked at this in, in Ali Beg, this Gurdwara, uh, I was reminded, I, I was taken to Raj Muhammad, the 92-year-old Baba inside the village in Kashmir, who tells me a beautiful story. He, as I, not, I mean, he, not a story, but beautiful experiences. As I sat with him, I was having a cup of tea, 92-year-old man, speaking very softly. And he started reciting the first verses of the Guru Granth Sahib, Guru Nanak's po po uh, composition of Jabji Sahib. He goes, Ik Omkar, Sat Naam, Karta Purak. And I looked at him, I said, Baba, how do you know this? He says, Sundar Singh was a great man. The man who led this Gurdwara and the establishment, he says, there used to be a Khalsa school next to it. 
And I tell you, in Pakistan, I've been to many schools, the government schools, the Islamia schools, and it has made me reflect that the Sikhs in leaving the lands gave up billions of dollars of educational investments because what that Baba said is what many people have told me of the olden age. He says, we used to aspire to go to Khalsa schools. The Khalsa schools had a brand name. And Sikhs had invested a lot of investment inside that. And therefore, if you go into many of these government schools and Islamia schools, and you will find, and I've shown many of them, Ikonkar written, something in Gurmukhi written inside them. You'll have to look for them because in seven decades, a lot of it is finished now. But it made me reflect what kind of investment we had to walk away from because going into India, the Sikh community has tried to reestablish the Khalsa brand of schools and colleges. We have done it. But I asked myself this question, did I choose to join the Khalsa College when I got admission there in Delhi? I chose to decline it because the reputation is not too great. Sometimes when your umbilical cord is severed from ages of, of, of investments that you made to build a brand and you are severed from it, you may not be able to create that impression once again. And that's the, the pain I experienced. But he tells me that we used to aspire to go to the Khalsa School and he says, I studied there. And he says, I used to spend a lot of time in the Gurdwara. And then he said a very interesting statement, which made me reflect Punjab was destined to be, de to be, to be, to be divided because of our own faults. There's a lot of positivity in these, in these lands because faiths had lived together for ages and we used to live together for centuries. But he made a very interesting statement, which made me reflect. What he said was, we used to, Sundar Singh was a very great man because the langar, the tradition of community kitchen, used to offer free food to everyone 365 days a year, 24 hours. And then he makes a comment. He says, we used to pick up sukka langar. Sukka langar means dry rations. I know the reason why he said that. I just probed him further. I said, if the food was being made, Baba, why would you pick up dry rations? Just pick up the food and eat it. And he smiles at me and he says in Punjabi, he says, Puttar, mazbada khed tenu pata. He says, you know the antics of the religion, what it makes us do. Basically, what he was alluding to was, on the Lahore station, there used to be two pots of water. And it's documented. One pot used to be for Hindus and the other for Muslims. And the water used to be filled from the same tap. What it means is that if you can't drink from the same pot, if you can't eat from the same utensils, Punjab had a hairline fracture. In spite of all the positiveness, there was a hairline fracture, which was used to the advantage of the British when they were leaving and was created into a communal mindset. And because of political motives and the reasons, other political reasons, it led to a separation and severance of centuries of civilizations that had learned to exist together. But as I was leaving, he said a very, 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 very heart-touching thing to me. He says, will you go back to India? And I said, sometimes, yes, I stay in Singapore. I sometimes, yes, will. And he says, can you do me my fa a favor for me? I said, tell me. He says, can you go and appeal to the people, the Hindus and Sikhs of Ali Beg, if they are there anywhere in India, that they must come back now. In his saying that, he had reflected a huge amount of emotion because what he wanted to do was to bring about a closure. And I looked at him, I said, Baba, how is this possible? The countries and the nations and the politics have divided us so deeply that there's no return on this. He says, I understand. But if you can convey my message, I'm about to die but I would like to see the people with whom I grew and I will return, I know where the lands were and I will return that land to them. I just smiled and walked away because it's not possible now. But the emotion of that man said, it lot, uh, said a lot. I went up to Baltistan. I want to make a small point out here. The remains of the Gurdwara in Baltistan, in Skardu, and the fort which was taken and made a part of the Lahore Darbar. The two battalions in 1840 which went from Lahore were led into by Zorawar Singh and Mohinuddin Shah. And the person whom they fought out here was Ahmed Shah. The point I'm trying to make out of these names is the following. These were not wars based on religion. People just get it wrong. I have done an article about Zorawar Singh, 30 years in search of Zorawar Singh, because I've traveled 
strangely and unknowingly deep into Tibet and other areas of Ladakh and in Pakistan where Zorawar Singh actually laid a footprint, right? He was, from, he was an employee of the, of, the, of the Darbar. And when I wrote an article about him, people turned around and say, was, and they're starting on a, a, a tug of war on the internet, and they, the, the question is whether Zorawar Singh was a Hindu or a Sikh. And I'm looking at that, those tug of wars, base tugs of war, because when I am a Sikh working for American Express, the leadership never asked me what my faith was. They paid me for my loyalty to the American Express organization. And the organization here was the Lahore Darbar. And irrespective of the fact that Mohinuddin Shah was a Muslim, Zorawar Singh was, a, was probably a Hindu or a Sikh, who knows his, his faith? And Hari Singh Nalwa was a Sikh. They were all giving their loyalty to the kingdom and not based on their faith. And yet, these two people who went inside with the battalions, Moinuddin Shah leading one battalion and Zorawar Singh leading one battalion, fighting against Ahmed Shah should be a reflection to show that this was not a time where Punjabis were fighting on religion. Because a Muslim could stand on the other side and be fighting against another Muslim because they were loyal to a territory and not because of religions. That's the point I want to make out here. And I think this Baltistan, the, 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 the documentation that I've given inside this book, uh, it, interestingly, I find a very... Uh, I went to the municipal corporation and I was shown some documents there that after this expedition of 1840, all the lands of Skardu were turned into the titleship under the Lahore Darwar of Khalsa Sarkar, the government of Khalsa. And today, yet when you take a lease title inside Skardu, the original titleship of that land is held by Khalsa Sarkar in the documents and I have shown the picture of that. What I want to share here is the beloveds of Nanak, what the people have forgotten and what Pakistan themselves does not know is that there are one million people in Sindh and Balochistan and in certain areas of Swat, Mardan and other places who are believers of Guru Nanak. Loosely, they are all called by everyone as Hindus. But ask them who they are they are opening more and more Gurdwaras in the format that the Sikhs of Punjab worship in. Similar kind of Gurdwaras, 200 of them I've seen actually, I've not documented all of them, but about 200 plus Gurdwaras in Sindh and Balochistan have been opened up. These are the communities that are forgotten. If you look at the Khanda out here, the Ekonkar, the writings of Guru Nanak's verses, and the ladies who are sitting out here, they look, look very least like the Punjabi ladies or the Sikh ladies, but yet their faiths are all about Guru Nanak and their attachment. This community of Nanak Panthis needs to be studied, needs to be brought to the limelight, because in India after the partition, this community has amalgamated into the broader faiths of the land and moved away from the association of Nanak. Is it because of we have not held them or they have been loosely bound into a, into a religion? religious boundary that they've found their ways to merge, but yet in Pakistan, one million such people are still existing. I have actually, I say it openly that maybe Pakistan government should ask these Sindhis and the Balochis, what is their faith? Maybe an open-ended question will tell us what do they feel like? Because when I'm talking to them, they are telling me something very different. I asked Bansri Lal, who is the head priest of a Gurdwara, they don't have any temples, they believe in the, in the Granth Sahib, the same practices as the Sikh community. They may not look like us in terms of a turban and beard, but they believe in all the elements of the faith. They have not graduated to the tradition of Khalsa, but yet they believe in all the elements of the faith. And I asked Bansri Lal a question for which he gave me a very interesting answer. I asked him at the Langar, I said, Bansri Lal ji, can you tell me how many Hindus in Pakistan are believers of Guru Nanak? And he looks at me and he says, Amardeep, it's so unfortunate that you still don't consider us as Sikhs. So I say to Pakistan government, let's ask them what they are. Because what Pakistan claims that there are 14,000 turban-wearing Sikhs is the definition that the world sees them as. Actually, there could be a one million number sitting there. And the game could change in Pakistan about what the Sikh faith is going through around the world. 
And I think this should start from there. Therefore, I believe the next phase of studies need to be done about these forgotten Nanak Panthi communities in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, and how they've evolved in India, because there's a huge story out here to be told to the world. I went to Quetta in Balochistan. I want to show you this, this group of Nanak Panthis. In the Gurdwara, they have two Guru Granth Sahibs lying out here. And all, all of them, and none of them, they, what they all got their heads covered in the Sikh tradition, but there's only one turban wearing Sikh out here. They're all people without Singh and Kaur as their last names. And the Granth Sahibs that they have, there are two of them. One is in Gurmukhi and one is in Urdu. The Urdu Granth Sahibs have stopped getting printed in India. They don't exist anymore. In Pakistan too, they are not being printed anymore because the last Granth Sahib in Urdu that was printed was in Hyderabad in somewhere in mid-1950s. The demand suddenly died. Some of these far off places, the communities are still holding on to some of the Urdu, Urdu script Granth Sahibs, right? And when I went to the school in Quetta, the largest school out there called the Special School, I thought it was a special needs school, but I was still wondering whether in Pakistan special needs is such a, such a big subject that you'll have such a big premises for just special needs kids. I went there and it was a Saturday, so I requested to go inside and the, and the watchman said that today is a Saturday and you can't go inside because the school's closed. I requested him, I said, can you please call up the, uh, the, the headmaster and request him that a Sikh has come from Singapore. And he did that. And the headmaster replied, he says, uh, ask him to wait there, I'm coming down. And 20 minutes he was there, he took me to his office. Inside his office, these black and white pictures on the wall, this is one of the pictures taken from there. This shows the hockey team. 60% of the team of pre-1947 were turban-wearing Sikhs. In the Indian subcontinent, Sikhs were known as the masters of hockey. And today we've moved so far away from that sport where very few Sikhs were playing hockey itself. And I'm looking at this, the Hindu Sikhs, Muslims sitting in this, in this team, the names are written below. And I asked Tukai Sahab, Tukai Sahab, can you tell me, and he also has got the picture of the founders, uh, founder of the school uh, on the wall. And I asked him, can you tell me, why is the school called special school? You know? And his answer is the most beautiful answer I heard. He says, you know, the Sikhs made this huge Khalsa school and in 1947 simply left it here and walked away. Isn't it such a beautiful special act that they gave it to us as a gift? I didn't have anything to say. I said, sir, you're, you, are, you are the man of hearts out here who's stolen my heart, you know. And, and he had said a lot in that. Now, you know, I could go on and on with these stories, but I'm sure you'll read the book, you'll find these stories. In the interest of time, um, I want to tell you what has Amardeep learnt out of these journeys, out of these frescoes, out of these artworks which don't exist in India anymore and do not motivate me to do these works in India. But Pakistan has these footprints, the communities, the artworks, the frescoes and I feel I'm honoured that Pakistan government has permitted me to go inside and do these things because the story needs to be told to the world. What was the story of the past and what has Amadeep taken away? This can take hours and hours and I can go on. You know, I've talked for two hours in some places about the Sikh military legacy remnants in Pakistan. I've talked about the Nanak Panthis themselves, the believers of Nanak in Pakistan. But today I'm just going to give you a, a stratospheric view quickly of what is it that I've seen from a legacy perspective in Pakistan. And basically the question that I get asked many times is, tell us how many Sikhs are living in Pakistan? Now, I say the long and the short answer of that is the following. The short answer is, when the violence of 1947 happened, the Muslims got wiped out from East Punjab. As I said, the starting, All communities have cried in this. And therefore, if I was to do this work in East Punjab, I would say the Muslim story is the same as our story. Because they got wiped out there too. But when I look, my subject is Sikh legacy in Pakistan. So therefore, I'm going to look at that. So therefore, I've marked this red section here, Punjab and Kashmir. The entire Sikh and Hindu population pretty much wiped out. As much what happened on this side of East Punjab. But this pocket of close to Peshawar and close to Afghanistan border, the Sikh community survived. Sikh community as we define as Singh and Kaur and Turban and Beard and so on and so forth. All the, all the defined religious boundaries of the faith, the people following that, the descendants of that are today 14 to 15,000 in number. 
and they are respect living as respectable citizens a lot of people ask me you know are not minorities facing challenges in pakistan you know what i say which country do minorities don't face challenges or which countries does not have challenges tell me it exists even in the most developed nations like us and the other places it exists right we've got problems everywhere but to say that a community is being persecuted i think you are just jumping to conclusion don't don't jump to what the media is trying to tell you live there and understand people are surviving people are living 1947 was an aberration an unfortunate aberration which no one can correct you and i cannot correct but to say that everything is a pits out in somewhere is not being fair right and therefore when i look at this group of people they have moved everywhere in pakistan and they are living as respectable citizens there was someone who said the other day and he was making a wrong statement uh, i think in one of my forums it someone said and i i didn't correct him because not right to at that point of saying thing but someone people have a belief that someone saying that nankana sahib is a place where the sikh community survived no nankana sahib is in punjab here and I, it's a red portion everyone was wiped out just like muslims got wiped out out here but today the descendants of this population from here are living in nankana sahib and there's a very large vibrant sikh community staying in nankana sahib but they are not punjabi sikhs there are pashtun sikhs from this region who speak pashto as their default language at home the problem with the sikh community of punjab is that they always want to equate sikhs is equal to punjabis it is wrong because sikhs are also equal to kashmiris sikhs are also equal to afghanis sikhs are also equal to pashtun people sikhs are also equal to sindhis and balochis a cultural affiliation has nothing to do with the religion of or the belief system of a person and therefore all the people i can tell you except for one or two families whom i know all the other in nankana sahib today are the descendants of this pashtun sikh community but what i want to talk about is this blue area tucked here close to punjab and khyber amb darband gorgusti buner and down here along the river indus 50 kilometers east of indus right up till afghanistan border into quetta and balochistan is what i call as the nanak panthis panth for those people who do not understand the uh, indian terminologies or uh, panth is basically a community nanak the believe the founder of sikh faith the community that belongs to nanak the founder of the sikh faith was a very very large section of people and many of them lived along the indus most of them actually lived along the indus belt and this community the ones who did not adopt the sikh khalsa traditions of a form of an organized sikh tradition are the ones who are living along these pockets and in their minds they think they are sikhs now in the last 25 years here's what's happening in pakistan and i say this openly that if there is any place that sikhism is on rise it's in pakistan it's a very bold statement i'm making but i've i've seen it it may be in small numbers but it is on rise because this community out here has opened over 200 gurdwaras inside this they are not historical gurdwaras but they have been opened this community out here has no temples no hindu temples that they go to but they only go to gurdwaras and they believe in guru granth sahib and I, therefore i talk about that bansri lal's discussion it's a community that needs to be evaluated studied understood because this community has dispersed in india and lost its roots they are still surviving out here 100% of the community in buner which is lying here in the last 20 years 100% of the next generation of this community they are not singhs and kaurs they are lal kumar and so on and so forth 100% of them have embraced the sikh form in the last 20 years so this is what the 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 community's footprint is but 1947 what happened is the community got dispersed into the gangetic belt now civilizations historically historically survived and thrived along the gange and along the river belts boundaries never used to exist that's why we have the nile civilization or we have the amazonian civilization we had the indus civilization we had the gangetic civilization the people of the indus civilization we the people of the five rivers the five rivers which went into the indus were dispersed into the gangetic belt and as a dispersal happens as one of the us based study says when communities get dispersed out of force the first generation becomes quiet the second generation becomes confused the third generation remains confused and some in them start asking questions as to what their roots are we are going through that phase
It happened with the Jews also. It has happened with every other community. If you ask a Syrian seven decades from now what's happening there and as they're getting displaced, it's the same answer you'll get. And therefore, we as we landed here, why do you think 10 million or one third of nearly Sikh communities moving out, living outside of India? It's probably this was a stopgap arrangement because we had lost our roots and now it doesn't matter, world is our roots. And we're going to make roots everywhere. So we are a descendants of a displaced community who have not yet found our roots firmly and we are, are, are planting. But as, a, as, as an outcome of that, the impact has been on our philosophy, our culture, our language and our heritage because we've lost it from our roots, the lands where our roots were. And I want to briefly talk a little bit about that. Guru Nanak is typic typically shown in art forms in across East Punjab, Sindh, Balochistan, West Punjab and Kashmir area and Khyber as a man sitting under the, under the big canopy of a tree and his Muslim companion Bhai Mardana playing the Rabab and his Hindu companion Bhai Bala standing next to him. What he's saying is, I talk to both Hindus and Turkis. He's not saying I talk to both Hindus and Muslims. This is a very fine thing out here. In the interest of time, I will not be able to get too deep into depth out here. But what I, want to, want, what I want to point out is, in the Granth Sahib, what they say is, the Sikh Guru is saying, Hindu Turak Dohu, se, dohu Ko Samjau. Hindu and Turak, I'm talking to. These are two cultures. Today, Hinduism is considered to be religion. But the word Hindu as a religion was not even existing in the Vedas. It only started happening in 980 onwards when the Turks came to the Indus River and they looked at a civilization that lived on that side as the civilization of the Sindhu and they could not say Sir and they said Hindu. That was a civilization. And therefore, Guru Nanak says this properly, Hindu Turak. He's talking about two civilizations. He's not talking about two faiths. Because in the, in the civilization of the, of the in, east of Indus, the word Sapta, the word, the weak Sapta, in the Turkic civilization, in the Central Asian, in Afghanistan and other places, becomes Hafta. Sir becomes a Her. Sindhu becomes a Hindu. And therefore, the people on this side was Turkis, on that side of the west were Turkis, and this side were the Sindhu people. And therefore, he's talking about Sindhu and Hindu, Sindhu, the Hindu people, and the Turki. I'm telling both of them, Humanity is what matters. And therefore, he's, all his pictures were always about the three coming together. And in Pakistan, in most of the monuments of the Sikh and Hindu era, Sikhs and Hindus, not the era, Sikhs and Hindus, you'll find, because it was a Punjabi population, you'll find this is very commonly put there. In the Sufi traditions, there are many Sufis who yet believe in Guru Nanak, though they may be, may be Muslims and Sufis. They yet respect Guru Nanak in the Pakistan tradition. Uh, and therefore, when I talk about philosophies divided, I make this point of the various, when I said that a legacy is reduced to religion, this is how philosophies get divided. Because today when the Sikhs go to Pakistan on a religious circuit, the Pakistanis themselves do not see beyond the Nankana Sahib and Punjab Sahib as the treasure and the vastness of heritage that lies in Pakistan. The Sikhs themselves do not see beyond Nankana Sahib and Punjab Sahib. It's a problem because when we go to Pakistan, I've asked this question to my community. Tell me when you go to Lahore, how many of you have gone as south to Pak Patan to see Baba Farid's place? And there is virtually no one till date has raised his hands. In the Sikh scripture, Baba Farid, the Sufi saint, his writings were given a place by Guru Nanak himself because he went to Pak Patan to bring his writings. And when we bow in the front of the scripture, I actually give as much of respect to Baba Farid as I give to Nanak. And if I can go to Guru Nanak's place in Nankana Sahib, I should also go to Baba Farid's place. But I don't. I did, but we as a community, we don't. And we prefer to go to all the other places like the market, shopping, eating, blah, blah, blah. But we don't want to go to these places. Sai Mia Mir's place, Guru Arjan Dev, the fifth Guru, actually when he was laying the foundation stone of Golden Temple, what did he do as a part of, of a very pluralistic message? He invited a saint from Lahore, Sai Miami, to come to Amritsar and lay the first foundation stone of the Golden Temple, the Darbar Sahib, which is the Mecca, Medina of Sikhs. And yet, I ask this question, how many of the Sikhs who go to Lahore even go to Sai Miami's place? You may not go there to worship. We're not asking about worship. But as much as I can worship at my home, I don't need to go to Nankana Sahib to worship because there's no place for pilgrimage in the Sikh philosophy. But yet, people do go because of their, their, their hearts being attached to those places. Something reminds them 
by my going to Baba Farid's place or by my going to Sai Miya Mir's place, I'm not worshipping there. Something attaches and reminds me of the value systems of what my forefathers used to strive for. And therefore, how many of Muslims are going to Guru Nanak's place? A tradition of Punjabis where we used to coexist amongst each other today are divided. And it has pained me many times at Dera Sahib Gurdwara in, in Lahore where Guru Arjan Dev Ji was martyred. When the security people ask my friend, a Muslim friend, to show his identity card and stop him from going inside because he's a, he's a believer of Muslim faith, it pains me. And I've asked him so many times, why would you stop him to go inside? He says, it's for your security, sir. And I say, you know what, if you have to give my security, put three layers of security out here, check them, but don't stop them from going inside because we create barriers. How do we come together as people? So that's what has happened as our, our, our philosophies have got divided. I want to talk about some frescoes. Punjabis respected Guru Nanak. And therefore, I, to, in comparative understanding of religions, one has to now go into the other faiths to understand how did they view my faith. But when I went to a lot of these, these frescoes inside the temples, which have also been equally lying abandoned, most of the temples you'll find these frescoes of the Sikh Gurus, where Guru Nanak is sitting and the nine Sikh Gurus along with him, and Bhai Mardana and Bala with the Rabab. Now, whatever be their, their other idols and other things inside, the point I'm trying to simply reflect out here is, the believers of that faith equally respected the Sikh tradition. And this has got fragmented. This has got finished off in East India because we have got compartmentalized into who we are. We don't need to become the other faith. I know organized religions always have their own boundaries, but we don't need to forget that the others and your forefathers were respecting these visionary people, which has been fragmented in the context of, of the of the new nation that has been formed because Punjab went through not one division. Punjab has gone through five divisions. Once in the creation of 1947 of India and Pakistan, thereafter in India itself got divided into Chandigarh, into Himachal, into Haryana and into Punjab. What we left are left with Punjab is not what our forefathers had played in a turf which ran from Chandigarh and beyond right up till the Khyber. That's the land where our forefathers used to churn together across faiths. And this is what these frescoes tell us, that people of all faiths respected the Sikh religion also. Oh, this one is from Batala Janda Singh, uh, near, uh, near uh, Gujranwala. Uh, Kila, Kila Mia, Mia, Mia Singh is a, is, a, is a village. But you know what? How many of these you want? My depository is filled with, with such pictures. Pardon me, there's always a? There's always a tree about... Of course, of course, there's always. It's symbolic, yeah. You know, it's, it takes, it requires a different mind and a different attention to go into these art forms of that and even start looking at these, although they're in a bad shape, to understand even these small things. If you're noticing a tree, I'm sure you put a, put a more concentrated vision into this, you'll find so many things coming out. As you'll see in the next one, I'll tell you what I saw. Because you need a minor, minute observation of these things to understand. Uh, if you just a, go, give a peripheral cursory glance, you will not understand most of the things. So I went into the mausoleum of Hajra Shah Santa Breze in Multan. Because when Guru Nanak went to Multan, Multan was a land of Sufis. The Sufis sent him a bowl of milk, symbolizing that this place is filled with spiritual people. There's no place for anyone else. He kept a few jasmine petals saying that the milk did not spill. All can coexist. And the, mill, the bowl was sent back. Thereafter, he came inside Multan and he went inside to this place of Hajar Shah Sam Tabrez. And there used to be, it's, it's, the historical records say that there used to be a Gurdwara close to this. Uh, remembering Guru Nanak's visit, I could not find the remains of the Gurdwara. But what I found was, as I entered, this Baba was sitting there. And he tells me, after ages, a Sikh has returned. And as I walked inside and went around, on these fresco, on these wall paintings and so on and so forth, what you look at is out here. And I've given this in my first book. What you find is names written in Gurmukhi of Sikhs. Now, I came running back to this Baba and I said, you said after ages a Sikh has come back. Who's writing these Gurmukhi names? Because in, in Pakistan, no one's writing Gurmukhi names out here, right? And these are very old scripture uh, writings, right? So he says, oh, these were written before 1947. Now, what it means is, 
because guru nanak came here there was a criss crossing no one is saying that we are believing in the grave or we are doing this and that that we are getting to theology and philosophy aspects but simply as a mark of respect sometime traditions remind us of our leaders why do we follow our, our, our leaders traditions is because it reminds us of what the message they were trying to convey right and that's what to me this was reflective of that our forefathers had no barriers to go into these place to remember what nanak was actually pursuing um and therefore architectural message i want to talk about the the mangad gurdwara is this one place that we can restore as a collective uh, effort because pakistan government has moved a lot from the time in 1947 when only nankana sahib was operational to today there are 24 historical gurdwaras that are operational now i'm not talking about the 200 gurdwaras of nanak panthis that are in sindh and in baluchistan those are community gurdwaras of the people who are living there but i'm talking about the historical gurdwaras they they've renovated about 24 of them but are they renovated in the way history and the and the and the heritage not the history the heritage should be maintained i think that's where the question mark is and i think that's a problem not just of pakistan there's a problem of the entire punjabi community i would say because i've been to the to the mausoleum of heer i've been to varish shah's mausoleum and i find that they have also been modernized to the last bit the problem is of the culture the people who don't understand what heritage maintenance is you don't build on the heritage you build around it you preserve that grave you build around it you don't build on that grave a more modern grave right i think that's the problem so most of our gurdwaras that our own sikh uh, uh, people are coming in with pot loads of money to pakistan the pakistan actually waqf board has been giving out contracts and i think the intent is that oh we want to help you please go ahead and maintain but these people are not qualified to maintain because in east punjab they've destroyed everything and i keep telling after my these two works in my brief discussions i'm having with with vacu trust property board in pakistan sir this heritage belongs to pakistan my forefather forefathers left it for you as much as they they say that this belongs to them and the people who from the sikh community who are coming in with pot loads of money to restore them it also belongs to me equally and i'm trying to tell you the senior voice that don't give the contracts unless you've got rules of engagement that don't let these heritage buildings be converted into marble and gold because these are the last remains of sikh heritage left anywhere in the world and it's in pakistan it's your responsibility to maintain it the question is when will it become our responsibility to maintain it i don't think we can restore everything the question is can the sikh community come together across the world to say we will pick up two or three such monuments and restore them in the manner our forefathers left it as the last sight of what our generations ahead can see that here are the two three monuments we left for you in the right way yeah so i think this is something for us to think i think the pakistan government will collaborate but if we need to come with the right plan and this cannot be done just by amardeep because i i'm a researcher i'm a writer i'm a, i'm getting new thoughts new things out to you all the question is how do we rally around it as a cause moral depictions these monuments have moral depictions that go beyond faith and moral depictions always convey a story the, in the past in the gurdwara's ruins i've seen depictions of even things like shravan kumar now shravan kumar may not look like a sikh of today like a turban wearing and and so on and so forth but organized religion has got its own space but the moral traditions could cut across faiths because shravan kumar is a beautiful story of a man of the indian subcontinent the story what is being said out here is that when his parents were very aged they wanted to go around on a pilgrimage and he offered his shoulder to put them into a basket and walk them across the continent continent to actually subcontinent to take them to these places of worship because he respected them the story is here out here of how to respect your parents it's nothing about a religion and these frescoes actually found a place and therefore i'm looking at this monument out here which i talked about the ban banno wali bir the first copy of the granth sahib which was written out here uh the beautiful building from inside when i look at it from outside the frescoes have no restriction of any faith inside the restrictions of the faith are that it's only the sikh gurus frescoes which are made and in the center when the where the worship would happen only words are written out here words from the scripture now to me the message is that all are welcome and therefore there's no restriction of faith and the sikh gurus are holding their hand and taking the center where only the word matters only the message of the granth which is the word which matters and therefore when i'm looking at all this i'm standing in the pakistan side in the village called ganda singh 
This is Ganda Singh Wala. It's a Sikh name. And I'm looking at the other side, the village on the other side of the border is Firozpur. Firozpur is an Islamic name. Firoz. And here's Ganda Singh. The irony is Punjab could have never been divided. And as I'm standing and looking at the irony, irony of the two villages, Firozpur and, and Ganda Singh, a Muslim village on that side and Ganda Singh out here. I've seen so many of them. Killa Jeevan Singh in Pakistan and Sarai Amanat Khan on the other side in, in India. Right? Islamic name on that side, the, the Sikh name on this side. It reminds me that for the Punjabis, it has felt like the, they left their jackets in India and their trousers in Pakistan. Because they can't even dress up after that, right? Uh, and therefore, when I went to Jhelum Gurdwara, I've looked at these, these uh, boards out there, the Gurdwaras, and the Gurdwaras are absolutely empty. No service has happened for seven decades. But yet, out here is written, out here, Asa di Var da Sameh. The morning prayer of the Sikhs, which is sung in every temple, it's yet waiting for that to happen. And therefore, I'm reminded of the sounds of silence of Simon and Garfunkel. Hear that sound of silence, the song tonight. And it reminds you of this. Sometimes the sounds of silence can be actually deafening because nothing has happened in these monuments for seven decades. And yet the, the program says, when is it going to happen? It's waiting as though. I want to talk about the, the uniqueness of recognize all human race as one. Because when you look at the Dera Sahib Gurdwara, what I found as a beautiful uh, coming together, the plurality or the, or the coming together of the communities, a Sikh, a Pashtun Sikh is sitting on the Granth Sahib and reading the Granth. The descendants, the Muslim descendants of Baba Nanak, or ba ba Bhai Mardana, the two of them doing Kirtan out here and a Nanak Panthi sitting out here from Sindh. To me, this was an all-inclusiveness message which was permitted in the Sikh faith to come together, right? But today it has become too hard that maybe these people will not get accepted by us. But in Pakistan, they are existing. And this is the beauty of the coexistence. And therefore, I want to... In the paucity of time, I'm not going to show the video of this one, but this is a Muslim community of descendants of, of Bhai Mardana, Guru Nanak's best friend, who actually are yet doing the Kirtan inside the Dera Sahib Gurdwara for 10 minutes every Sunday. And, and the interesting thing that they told me is that the irony of partition is such that our forefathers used to do Kirtan at the Golden Temple and at the Goindwal Sahib Gurdwara in Amritsar area. And when partition happened, we moved this side, our father moved this side with the hope that we'll be able to go back. But the partition line was so hard that it could never go back. And today the irony is that we sing in these Gurdwaras out here, but there's not a single Sikh to hear to us. I mean, we are singing to the walls, basically, out here. Uh, culture and arts. I want to show this place, which is pretty much destroyed and finished because the communities have gone. This is a place which was of the Udasis. The Nanak Panthi tradition was very, very big. And the Udasis tradition, I want to just make one point out here because I've tried to go into the places of the others because these don't exist in India. The Udasi tradition places have all been again plastered and whitened and turned into glittering places and there's nothing of past left. Now in Pakistan as I've gone inside these, although it looks like a pretty bad state, it's a Pakistan's heritage. I think the Pakistan government should maintain this place in Dipalpur. Beautiful frescoes inside it. There's a fresco here of, I found of what my forefathers, today the western world is talking about women's empowerment. In way back in 1600s, it shows of women going for hunts and men were sitting and chilling with, with hawks sitting in their hands, right? So it's that of women's empowerment, which was way, way ahead, right? And I'm looking at these frescoes. All I can take away is 90% of these frescoes are about Sikh traditions. The Sikh gurus, the Sikh military traditions, the Sikh stories, and so on and so forth. And when I look at them, I say, you know what? Yes, the Udasi tradition is not considered to be a part of the Sikh faith today. But somehow these people felt so close to us that they were drawing only the Sikh traditions in their art form. Why would someone draw the Sikh tradition if they were not actually close to us? Is the question that I ask. I don't have the answers to these. But it's a question I ask. They believed in us. That's where they drew it. right? And therefore, I'm just bringing this to an end to the last two slides. Amongst all these emotions, as close to the Ratcliffe line, dividing India and Pakistan, I walked into this remains of this Gurdwara made in the memory of the third Sikh Guru. Most of it is, all of it is fallen off, converted into an agricultural land. Only one, pill, one section of it is standing and that too it's leaning. I call it as a leading tower of Punjab. And as I'm looking at it, I walked in and I touched it after having photographed it. And as I touched it, it spoke to me. And I want to share with you what it spoke to me. Because it's very relevant because it raised a question for me afterwards in my mind. 
it says to me, welcome back. Welcome back, where were you for seven decades? And I kept hearing it, and it says, where were you for seven decades? Because when Nadir Shah from Persia came, massacred your community, Ahmed Shah Abdali came, massacred what you call as the first holocaust and the second holocaust in the Sikh history, what is known as Pehla Kalukara and Second Kalukara. Yet you stayed here. So what happened in 1947 that you simply chose to walk away? Did you not have a moral responsibility towards us? Now, this is the monument that's asking. I know the history. So a lot of time people start getting up and telling me why we walked away. I know the history, so let's not waste time on that, right? But the fact is the monument's emotion which says, why did you walk away? And as I walked away, I asked myself this question, was there a solution where we could have coexisted on both the sides of the border? I don't know the answer. But I know that the Sikhs were 18% of the greater Punjab's population. We were going to be, we were a minority. We had a kingdom. We had an empire. We were a minority. We are still a minority everywhere in the world. And if the nation was being divided, we would have been a minority on both the sides. That wouldn't have changed. So could there have been a solution that we could have coexisted on both sides of the border? I don't know the answer, but it was a very important question that I still ponder upon. And I want to end on a positive note because at Basali, when I went in, this old man saw me and he gives me a big hug. And this is the human emotion that we need to anchor on. Works of monuments, works of tangible, intangible, there's enough to read on it and there are human emotions interspersed. But at the end of the day, I believe in the human values. Because as I walked in, he gives me a big hug and he says in Punjabi, and I'll translate it, he says, Aj tenu ke jindar di yaad aage. What he's saying is, by looking at you today, I'm reminded of my childhood friend Jindar, whom he has not met for seven decades. Because the lines divided them. And as I was coming out from Baba Bulla Shah's mausoleum, the great Sufi poet, whom not just the Muslims and the Sufis uh, revere, Sikhs, Hindus, everyone reveres, because he's a Punjabi poet. And as I was coming out, this man limping, on the other side of the road, says to me, Ji Ayanu, welcome. And he rum, comes rushing this side. This shop is not his. But he picks up the petals, and in that moment, a friend of mine clicked this picture, and he sh showers those petals on me. And he says, if I cut my finger, and if I cut your finger, does blood flow in yours, and does milk flow in mine? And I want to end here, because this is about human story, and this human story applies to all communities. I have chosen to study it from a Sikh lens perspective. If I'm given a chance to do this from any other community's perspective, Hindu or Muslim, I think the story of partition will be the same. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any question. I know we've, we've just got about 10 minutes or so, so I can take a few questions if you want. So in asking questions, again, uh, as Jonathan said, uh, I request let's not tell our comments because time is little out here. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, so I... So as I said to you, I, maybe you missed the in, in, the, in the beginning. Uh, you came late. Uh, I, I went into Pakistan in 2014 first. And by now, it's been uh, three and a half years that I've spent in these two publications, which are these two thick publications. Uh, now, these are available. And if you want, you can actually go to Amazon.com and write for the book's names. Or you can go to LostHeritageBook.com and order there. Or if you go to Rajwant, he's sitting here. And you can tell him he's bringing in some books. He can actually arrange to have it uh, give, given to you. You can meet Rajwant afterwards. But to answer to your question is, uh, so these two books from the research, to the completion of both the books has taken me three and a half years from the time I stepped to Pakistan in 2014. Um, but actually, I tell you that it's a journey of over 30 years. Because over 30 years, I did not know what I was doing. I was doing my, my job, and I was just doing all kinds of spirituality studying and faith studying, history studying, photography, writing for magazines. I think all those skills came into handy the day my corporate career ended, not knowingly why it was ending. I was in, in a confused state, but the new door opened. And I think that's when now I can rationalize and say, actually, God was preparing me for 30 years. I think it's a very tough task to do if you just walk into the country today and think you can replicate this, because a lot of energies over a period of time has to come together. Yeah. Because uh, three and a half years is not enough to do what you did, you know, so it's 
No, it's not. I'm running at a maniacal uh, pace. I only know it's taking a toll on my body, on my mind. Uh, I'm hitting a uh, roadblock. There's a lot of challenges around. Uh, each book is a six years PhD work. It can, in an academic environment, take you 12 years to 13 years to do it. But yet, we've got from three to three and a half years. Yes. I'm Manjit Taneja. I'm really touched. I want to share with all of you something, and then I'll ask you a question. So this afternoon, I met a gentleman, and he came to me. He said, first thing called Sardar. He still said, Krishna, hello. I'm a Sardar. So I said, first thing called. And he said, how long have you been here? How many do you want to meet rattle? There's an entire communities and communities living there who don't. So there are, as I said, there are one million people who are Sikhs themselves, who are sitting there, who are proud Sikhs. In their minds, they're Sikhs. There are 14,000 turban-wearing Sikhs whom we think as Sikhs and whom Pakistani government counts as Sikhs. But the hearts of one million people are believers of Sikh faith. That's the Sikh Sikhs themselves. How many people do you want me to count? There are many People I've mentioned, whom I've met, had lunch with them, had stayed with them, who have Sikh backgrounds, but had to change their faith either out of choice, either out of compulsion, either out of circumstances. My own distant aunt's story in the first book, Meeting Nuri, who was Jaswanti, is there. Uh, my own uh, real aunt's two sons had lived as Christians inside uh, Rawalpindi for two years because they were five and six years old and their parents were were departed from them were separated from them in the in the Muzaffarabad massacre and it, they were found after about three to four years. My book starts from that story. There are umpteen number of instances like this. The upheaval that happened was one million people died, ten million people moved. The cultures have shifted. The people from the Indus from the Gangetic Belt were thrust into the Indus Belt, and the people of Indus Belt thrust elsewhere. It's a hodgepodge that has happened. Languages, the issues that we're talking about, the people from Gangetic Belt don't understand the history and the faiths, how they intertwined in this beautiful land of Indus. We were never separate. The Hindu Sikhs and Muslims, though, were fractured, hairline fracture, but knew how to live together for centuries. And that's why poetry, our beautiful things, scriptures reflect that, right? But yet, when partition happened, people who were not even knowing of this culture were thrust into this land and therefore emerged a total confused state of mind on both sides of the border. We have to go back to humanity. Yes. <laughs> so the, the next steps basically, you know, okay, the, the short answer to that would be, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, I am living in a creative space after my 25 years of corporate world where I've where I used to make five-year plan, 10-year plan, 20-year plan, and never achieve them. And, you know, and now I, I make no plans and something happens. Right? So I don't know. But I am under immense internal turmoil. Um, 
And I think the internal turmoil should be there because if you don't have the internal turmoil, creative space cannot generate anything. And, uh, and Gurbani says this very well. Dukh daru, sukh rog bheha. Dukh daru, dukh is sadness becomes your medicine, the remedy, and happiness becomes your source of pulling you down, your, your disease, right? And I think the unhappiness is not the ha unhappiness from the world, but it's the state of my mind that I grapple with day in and day out because my project seems to be coming to an end. And do I go on this path further? There are Nanak Panthis who are waiting to be called and to be addressed and to be studied. How do I do it? I don't know. Can I do it? I don't know. There is a world which requires financial commitments. There's a family that requires. I don't know how to do it. But last time I was thrust into this by some unknown force. Will it thrust me into it again? I just need to eat bread and butter. I don't need to become a wealthy man. But what I'm leaving here, I know, is the wealth for the, for the future communities to come. Of course. Sense, okay, go ahead. If you don't believe in something, nothing's going to happen. If I didn't believe that I could could generate a research, just my own belief, nothing would have happened. I think everything stems from belief. So we have to believe that we can change the world for positivity, right? Then things will start happening. As far as you're saying that so much is happening around, yes, a lot is happening. But if I'm going to be very myopic on this subject of Sikh legacy in Pakistan, sorry, I'm going to ask you what else has happened in seven decades? Other than just maintaining the Nankana Sahib, Panja Sahib, going round and round in circles, whitening them, putting gold, putting your money inside it, giving more money to people to go and destroy more of our heritage. What else has happened? Nothing. It's taken you seven decades to generate anything on a legacy. Some Gurdwara books have been generated, but it's all Gurdwara centric and legacy is not religion. So I don't think anything has happened as yet. Things can happen. What I think is that what we are leaving in the forms of these 1000 pages is a dialogue initiator. It's the foundation of something on which both for the Pakistan people and for the Sikhs and for the Hindus and for the Muslims that allows us to come together and say, oh my God, we have forgotten this. I think my work should inspire a Muslim to get up and do the same thing in East Punjab. I think my work should inspire a Jain and a Hindu for doing the same thing in Pakistan. And when we can do it all together, it's not just about Sikhi. It's about a bigger picture, about all coming together. But from a Sikh perspective, I hope these two works become the foundation of us to get, build castles on them. Uh, but without having the data, you cannot do anything. I'll tell you, I met Evacuate Trust Property Board in, in February this time with the, with the head of the Evacuate Trust Property Board. He's looking at two of my books which are gifted to them and he's asking a very interesting question. And that, therein lies the answer of hope and, 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 and what we can do. He's opening the book and he says, where is this place? And I'm looking at him and I said, sir, my forefathers left it in your custody. You tell me where is it? He called his man, get the register, see if this place is there. What I'm trying to say is people do jobs, bureaucrats do jobs. They're there for three to four years to do their job. First year, they're trying to learn. Second year, they're trying to grapple. Third year, they're trying to look at the next exit plan, next job. Who's doing the job of maintaining and doing things? And then comes our community with potloads of money. They open the doors for us to actually go and preserve it. And the preservation is not heritage maintenance. And it's heritage destruction. So when he's asking a question, where is this place? I'm happy he's asking that question because now the data is lying in his, on his table. And he tells the man, Make a trip next fortnight. I want to go to Sindh and see the Shikarpur. I want to see this place. Whether something happens or no, what is the momentum we can build? Time will tell. Can I lead everything? No, I'm one man right now. Can we come together and do something? I think we can. A lot can happen. I think the intent is there. The government has the intent. The question is how do we navigate through this? How do we not get stuck in our, in our, in our mud slingings and think of a bigger picture? Because a lot needs to be done. Sure, I'll take hers. Um, I was curious to hear what the response has been when you've approached either Gurdwara committees in India, but specifically from the Indian government and Sikh living in India. Because I 
feel like how we are, a lot of us I think are, or at least my generation, we're born and raised in the States. We, I like to think that we have a very secular view of society, but we feel like there's a disconnect between us and older generations or how it's practiced in India now. So how has the response been? Response to what? So I, I think response is the same everywhere. It's got nothing to do with, with India, Pakistan, or, or US, or UK, wherever the Sikh community is, response is the same. The struggle for me as an individual has been the belief that I have in me that this needs to be done, and struggling to do it, to do it, and get it to a point where it is now, and now engaging with communities to bring them together. It has not been easy. But in that process, the question is maintenance of the monument is a far off vision. In the midterm, I'm already having dialogues with the Pakistan government, I'm having dialogues with different, different people, but yet we are not able to come together as a cohesive force. But I believe somewhere it has to start. Because if we start, magnet will actually pull us together. But if you're doing the right thing, things will come together. So as of right now, these are early days, we're not able to pull together people to own a monument and preserve it. That's number one. The number two is, the short-term approach is, in India, for instance, I'm saying, you know, you can afford these books. These books are not easy to do. You have to give up a huge amount. You have to do research costs. You have to throw money to get the data out inside. You have to physically go and do it. And then print it in the publication. It gets expensive in India for the common man in India. For Pakistan, it gets expensive. My vision is you can afford it in, in these worlds because your purchasing power is much bigger. But in India, it always gets questioned, why are the books so expensive? They're seeing it as a book. They're not seeing the experience and, the, and the, in, the, 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 the things that have gone behind it. And I'm telling this is about your own heritage. When are you going to own it? They are not even wanting our organization in India have not even supported me to my simple program that I'm saying, help me put these books inside the libraries of Sikh institutions inside. It's been three years now. Not a single organization in India, in Punjab, has come forward to say, we will take 200 books to put them inside the schools and colleges because the next generation needs to see it. They've not seen it for seven decades. That's the kind of blankness that you see, right? So that's the big issue out here. I'm saying, why should the Pakistanis not have these books? Because I get every month five to six people asking me in, in, in Pakistan, from Pakistan, I want to do a PhD work on this. I want to look at the Sikh murals. I want to see it, understand some Sikh theology, Sikh architecture. And, and I'm believing that these books need to be put out there. You know what? It's a big problem to get these books inside the institutions there because from India, you have to move huge amounts of books. How can we enable this through a partnership with Pakistan government? And who will support this? If I'm going to expect that each individual organization is going to actually bring in a book, it may not happen. Can there be a wealthy Sikh man who says, you know what? I'm going to sponsor 100 books for your project and get them inside. I'm struggling to get that. So it is a struggle. It's not easy. And the last thing what I'm saying is, when I look at Nanak Panthi sitting there, let's talk about where does Amardeep evolve this? Amardeep's proven himself that I have the ability to do that. I've done two publications in a very short time. Do I want to study Nanak Panthis and understand and document them for our next generations? It's a project that needs to be done. Am I getting support? I'm hitting, hitting a red head block, uh, in a, uh, um, a roadblock. I don't know where to go now from here because I'm not associated with an institution. I don't have grants with me. I'm just doing it on my own. So all I'm trying to tell you is it's a challenging task. But I believe if you do the things right, if you lay the foundation on this, someone is going to build the castle. Will it be me who will build it? I don't know. But someone is going to build it for sure. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.